Jeff. What's up? How are you doing? Hey, Milena. How are you? I'm a little excited, actually, uh, because I got something in the mail from you. <laughs> and I haven't opened it yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid and excited at the same time. <laughs> That's uh, perfectly reasonable. Well, I mean, you remember uh, the last episode, you very gently suggested that I could send you something in return for that lovely gift that you gave me in our episode about mem sensors. So I decided to take the hint. The episode about mem sensors was ages ago. What is it? Well, what does it look like? Uh, it's a small wooden box, but I can't seem to open it, so... I got no idea what's inside. Okay, well, can you describe the box? I mean, it's just a black box. Oh. Well, yeah, but I thought that would be a, a nice reminder nice. of all these times that we've talked about AI together. I got the hint, black box AI, uh-huh. <laughs> but Jeff, seriously, that's not actually what people want, right? We want transparent AI. So is there a trick to see what's inside? <laughs> there absolutely is. And we'll hear about that later in the show. Welcome, dear listeners, to episode nine. From know-how to wow, the Bosch Global Podcast. I'm Jeff Gostaitis. And I'm Lena Otwolf. Hi, everyone. One of our guests says he's working on something that every AI developer wants. This kind of use case is actually pretty much every developer wants or AR developer wants to be more precise. Mm -hmm. And what would that be? Love, friendship, world peace, more data? Well, let's see. Jeff, how much of a data nerd are you? Well, funny you should ask. Uh, this time last year, during the, the first round of Corona Teen, uh, I took a series of courses through the Boston University. And one of them was actually for uh, data analytics. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess you could say I dabble. Not bad, yeah. I mean, we gather so much data, right? Uh -huh. All the time. All around us, data mm -hmm. is being generated yeah. and stored. But to me, the interesting question is, what do you do with it? Right. Data in and of itself doesn't necessarily have much value. In fact, it's the lowest level of what's called the wisdom hierarchy, uh, below the capital I information and below the capital K knowledge. You have to find the value in it, and you have to extract it. Which often means to visualize it, right? You know, an Excel sheet doesn't get me excited personally, <laughs> but a nice chart might. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You can look at the data raw forever and not see anything. The volume is often just far too much for a human to process. And it's not structured in any way to give it context or mm -hmm. meaning. Yeah, but when you turn numbers into something graphical, you can suddenly relate to the data. And even more so if you turn the numbers into something physical, something you can touch and feel. So materialized data. Right. Tell me more about that. Jeff, meet your fellow Americans, Emily McNeil and Justin Connolly. After the presidential election in 2016, we were sort of joking about how climate data would be taken off of government websites and a lot of this research would be disappeared as the new administration came in. And uh, I just, I joked like, oh, we should record data and like clean up on tablets or tapestries that you can't just hit delete and it's gone. And then we decided then we to do it. it. <laughs> so we've been doing it for three years now. Doing what exactly? Emily and Justin started knitting. They knit climate data into tapestries, wall hangings. Oh, wait, I've seen this, I think. Uh, people are also knitting blankets or scarves, and they color code the temperature data right into them, mm -hmm. right? Correct. Typically, you knit one row per day, and you choose the yarn color depending on the max temperature on that day. Justin and Emily call what they are knitting tapestries. And it's funny because the word tempestry, we just made that up at the beginning of all of this for temperature tapestry. But now we're starting to see tempestry being used for everyone doing their own little temperature projects as well, which has been sort of neat, you know, that our made up word has become a bit of a standard for this kind of project at this point. Setting a standard, that is definitely their thing. They also try to make sure that everyone working on a project like this use the same color scale. So on their website, tempestryproject.com, they publish a template where you can see what color to use for a specific temperature. It starts with black for everything below minus 34 Celsius. 
That's about minus 30 Fahrenheit. And then you have different shades of blue, then greens and yellows for moderate temperatures, and oranges and reds for high temperatures. That makes sense. So all of these tempestries that people knit are comparable, mm -hmm. and you can immediately see the commonalities and differences across different locations or different time frames. Exactly, and that can really have an impact. Also, people are not only knitting the current year day by day. Some also take historic data and knit a range of years. There are exhibitions of tempestries and galleries and museums, and Emily and Justin say when they did the first exhibition in their hometown in Oregon, they already saw how people immediately connected to the data. This woman came to the, we had a display here in town, and this woman came to check it out, and she's staring and, and walking up and down this wall of tempestries. And she comes up to us after being there for probably like a half hour, and she just said, you know, I've been sort of a climate skeptic for all my life, but... I found in my, my childhood, like this week right here, and she took us over to the tempestry and showed us this week in like early winter, February maybe, of blue colors in this piece in 1957. And then you look down the wall and that color never happens again. And she says, and I remember I was ice skating on the local lakes here and those lakes haven't frozen. In decades, in, pretty much. In, yeah, in decades. And it, it, the proof is right here. Like you, that color doesn't happen again. Yeah, I really feel that. <laughs> totally. It's it's not just a, a visualization of data. It's it's a manifestation of the data as a physical object. And for sure, when one is able to find a personal connection to something, like like this woman did, when she pointed out that one blue line, you know that that can leave quite an impact. And I think it's a combination of combining this ancient craft with modern data and climate concerns as they get bigger and bigger. So it sort of bridges a gap between not just generations, but between ways of thinking, you know, between this artistic rendering of cold, hard facts that people have a hard time relating to sometimes. <laughs> what's, what's the correct idiom here? Seeing is believing, I guess. <laughs> Seeing is believing. Yes, exactly. And and that seems to work perfectly here. So the lesson is you need to visualize data when you want to make it relatable. And as a bonus, you also get to knit. I think you also have to be smart about the data that you choose to visualize. Mm -hmm. Emily and Justin, for instance, decided to go with the daily high temperature and not the average temperature. And why was that important? Because as they say, the maximum temperature is what people feel. You don't really have a sense for a day's average temperature, don't you? No. Plus, they are breaking the giant problem of climate change, which can be quite overwhelming. They are breaking it down into digestible portions. Mm -hmm. One year at a time, one location at a time. Okay, that makes perfect sense. But, but one limitation of this project, though, uh, yes, it allows people to better relate to climate change, but it doesn't necessarily tell them what to do with that information. It's, I mean... It's not necessarily actionable. Mm, yeah, true. It conveys the urgency to do something, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Somebody do something. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, that gives us the next natural question, which is what's the next step? Yes. We've gone from data to data visualization. What would be a solution that helps people to act on that visualized data? Well, one solution is called visual analytics. Right. That's a method that is used in artificial intelligence. And we're lucky enough that one of our fellow Bosch associates and his team are leaders in this field. So visual analytics is a technology that combines machine learning or AI, data visualization, and uh, user interaction to improve the transparency of the AI system. And also help us to acquire the actionable insights to improve the performance of our AI systems. This is Dr. Liu Ren, VP and Chief Scientist of Integrated Human Machine Intelligence. He works in our research lab in Silicon Valley. In recent years, he and his team have won three Best Paper and Honorable Mention Awards from the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, that's IEEE -E -E for short, Visualization Conference, which, for those of you that don't know, is the leading scientific conference of this type. So he's going to tell us about some cutting-edge science. 
Maybe I can ask him to help me look into that black box you gave me, considering that you don't want to help me, apparently. <laughs> maybe you'll get lucky. <laughs> or maybe you just ask nice, and I will. <laughs> no way. But anyway, so back to Dr. <laughs> Ren. Uh, so before we were talking about data visualization, and what Leo and his team are doing is not just to visualize data to acquire some insights, but also to add interactive capabilities to that visualization in order to inform the user what actions could be beneficial in order to make another AI better. But why is that a challenge in the first place? I mean, to make something better, you just require some smart engineers, don't you? Some smart engineering <laughs> problem solved? That's how spoiled we are in Bosch. We just think, throw some smart engineering at it, no problem. Um, there has to be somewhere, someone smart enough. <laughs> yeah, someone knows it. Someone has figured out this problem. Um, it, of course, it's not that straightforward. <laughs> As you know, many AI systems are what we call black boxes, like your gift. Mm -hmm. We don't really fully understand what's going on inside or the mechanisms which develop internally. How the AI makes a decision or recognizes something in an image isn't always clear, right? And it's not only that users don't know what's going on. For developers, an AI can also be something of a black box. They don't always know what to do to make it better. For example, why it works well in some cases and not so well in others. So a visual analytics system provides you a systematic way to quickly identify the issues of your AI models. And then it also helps you understand the reason behind. So you know why this model works well for certain parts and doesn't work well for the other parts. So coming back to my little black box here, visual analytics helps them to look into the black box, mm -hmm. almost like an X-ray. How does this software X-ray actually work? Yeah, well, of course, that's where it gets a little complicated. Basically, what they do is use one AI, which is pointed towards the AI that you want to analyze. In this process, the human or the user usually only needs to provide a little bit of guidance. And then what happens is the visual analytics AI could look at the training data, could look at the system which is in question itself, or could look at the series of data the examined model AI generated in order to make a decision. Oh, wow. OK, so if <laughs> yeah, I imagine right. this little black box, let me try to break that down. <laughs> so this little black box that you gave me, let's imagine this would actually be an AI that plays chess, for example. Mm -hmm. So the visual analytics system would look at all the chess games that you used to train my chess AI. Right? Exactly. Spot on. You got mm -hmm. it. Because a great way to make your chess AI better is to give it better training data. Mm. So not just more data, but some more specific data that fills some knowledge gaps of my learning chess machine. Exactly. The visual analytics system points you to those gaps in your data. So when people see that this part of data is not enough, people can quickly understand what kind of data we need more in this case. And it does that in a visual way. Liu's AI looks at the training data in a different way than your chess AI does, than your black box does. Mm -hmm. The visual analytics AI extracts information from the training data that it can display in a visual way. So that, for instance, you can see the data mapped by certain criteria. And when you start directly seeing these clusters, like on our tempestries, they illustrate where your system works well and where it doesn't. So we need to use machine learning or use AI to convert the data to a format or a representation that can be visualized or that can be easily communicated to the user so the user can understand. That's actually a big part of the system, a lot of mathematics here. And also for different problems, we sometimes might need to use different AI methods to learn such a representation. So beware, this is complicated stuff. It's specialized, mm -hmm. which means there's no one-size-fits-all visual analytics system. Mm, that means for my chess AI, I couldn't just download and run some visual analytics software to see how you constructed or trained it. Mm -hmm. The visual analytics system would have to be specifically tailored to my chess AI, correct? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, okay. that's correct. To, to understand this better, maybe maybe let's move on from the chess bot <laughs> example. All right. Uh, Leo can walk us through an example use case that he and his team actually worked on. But before we do that, I just want to say, talking to Leo about this high-tech systems uh, and hearing about the knitters painstakingly knitting <laughs> their way through years of climate data, isn't it amazing how much effort we put in to visualizing data? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, our brains don't have a data port, so it seems like our eyes are the best channel to put some knowledge into our brain cells to shove it in. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why visualization is so important. <laughs> brain data port, I like that idea. Um, but yes, humans are certainly visual animals. That's, that's what people say at least, right? Yeah, but what does that actually mean? To what extent is our brain an image recognition system exactly? Here to help us answer these questions is Michelle Green. About a third to a half of our brain processes information visually in some way or another. She is a neuroscientist at Bates College. So with all that brain power dedicated to image processing, we're pretty good at it. One of the fundamental characteristics of our visual system and something that I've, I've spent a number of years studying myself is just the sheer speed with which we can apprehend visual information. Michelle shows people a quick series of 10 or 12 pictures. Well, image, 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 you know, 10 images a second, 20 images a second, something <laughs> that like that. That's just rapid fire. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. She uh, then tells people to look out for something in this rapid series of images a baby with a balloon, or people having a picnic. And even in a stream where everything's changing so quickly, you've got colors and textures and objects and everything coming at you faster than your fastest action movie trailer, people can pick that up right out of a lineup, which is, uh, which is really incredible. And that really puts an upper bound on how long it takes to understand content. Yeah, but it really is like this. Uh, I mean, you can explain a concept to someone for, for a long time. I mean, as, as we say in English, until you're blue in the face. <laughs> and, nice. and they still might not get it. <laughs> right? I like that one. Um, or you could just go ahead and draw them a picture, you know, like we do on the whiteboard in every meeting room on the planet. And it's immediately clear. A picture is worth a thousand words. <laughs> that is right. <laughs> That is right. Romanticize you know as many that. English idioms as I do, <laughs> uh, right? <laughs> but but why though? Why why is it that we are so good at this stuff? So Michelle says, when we see something, we might not need to process everything in a detailed way. The world isn't chaotic. There are some regularities. One spot on the wall is pretty similar to the spot next to it. Michelle calls this top-down knowledge. You know, one of the leading ideas for why is it that we're so good at processing images is that either through evolution or development or some combination of these things, that our brains have encoded these statistical regularities such that you don't have to process it all from the bottom up, that you can put some kind of top-down knowledge of what should be there based on how the world works, how gravity works, how you know, just kind of the physics of the world getting baked into our brains to help us with, with vision. You know, if you go around and you talk to a lot of folks in vision science, most of us agree with this, but testing it rigorously is pretty hard. So all that to say, the short answer is, we don't really know for sure <laughs> how or why we are so good at processing all these images, which, I mean, to me, by, by that itself is also fascinating. One way Michelle tries to find out more about it is by asking what are we not good at? So, reverse logic here. <laughs> One <laughs> yeah, okay. thing she tried is asking people to recognize a more unusual image in that stream of images. The uh, Dalai Lama wearing a cowboy hat. <laughs> well, what, what's unusual about that? That seems perfectly normal. <laughs> Daily business, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can, you can totally picture it, right? The Dalai Lama. Okay, I know that. Cowboy hat. Very clear. Families in Texas, totally normal for me. <laughs> uh, but that specific image, I have not seen before. You know, you probably couldn't have seen it. You probably don't have a template for what that should look like. But everybody gets it. <laughs> Immediately. It's, it's amazing. Then she also tried something different. You know, for machine learning systems, neural networks, some images are easier for them to recognize than others. 
So she had an AI categorize some images, and some of them were easier for the system, others harder to categorize. She took the same images and showed them to people and asked them to categorize the pictures. For the images that were easy to recognize for the AI, people were very accurate too, 96% accurate. For the hard images, they were still accurate. They're, you know, dropped down to maybe 91%, so they made a few more mistakes. But they took a much longer time to do it, about 200 milliseconds later, which, you know, in terms of reaction time, it's a huge reaction time effect. Interesting. So AI systems and human brains actually struggle with the same things. I don't think I really would have expected that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me neither. And this similarity is one reason why Michelle Green thinks that studying artificial neural networks can help her understand the human brain. You know, as opposed to a brain, you can dissect an AI, if you will, to better understand it, <laughs> which is really fascinating. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just want to get, a, now that you said that, I get a little meta on us for a second oh, wow. here. If, if you said that really as simply as possible, really just boiled it down to the, the, the bare necessities of it, it would be something like a brain, a real human brain, built a fake brain to better understand how a real brain works. <laughs> Which is kind of <laughs> hard. Perfect. I feel like I just stepped it back into the matrix for a second there. But I mean, yes, that's what happened. You, you, A real brain built a fake brain to understand a real brain. It's a wild. little meta here. A little meta. A little a little, a little, a little, come on. But yes, <laughs> I think this shows that our brain truly is a visual powerhouse. Michelle and other scientists don't fully understand mm -hmm. yet how the brain does it, but AI could help them find some answers. With a fake brain, that's right. The fake brain. Uh, which is a perfect <laughs> bridge back to Dr. Wren and his team's work at Bosch Research in Silicon Valley. His quest to make AI better, for instance, at recognizing images. So how do they do that? You promised an example implementation. That's true, I did. Please deliver. The general idea is to inject some human brain power and ingenuity into the AI. Because we humans, as we discussed, are still better at some of these things. So once we know where the AI is struggling, we can help out and teach it to recognize a broader range of images. So in this example, the AI is trying to recognize traffic lights. Mm, something that would be very useful in an autonomous driverless car, I suppose. What a fantastic example. Do you work for Bosch? <laughs> Ta-da. <laughs> it seems you have some interest in that. Um, and also something that sounds a lot easier than it is. Traffic lights come in many shapes and forms, like you've seen in any CAPTCHA anytime you've been oh, asked for God, one wow. on the internet. Yes. Oh, they can have a lot of variations regarding the appearance of those traffic lights, you know. Uh, lighting, that could be lighting changes, and there could be weather changes. So a lot of these factors that can affect the appearance of these traffic light images you could acquire from your camera systems. Another big issue is motion blur from the camera. Or it could be as simple as a snowflake partially blocking the mm -hmm. view. And, well, the fact alone that a German traffic light looks pretty different from an American one. <laughs> that makes it pretty hard, I'd say. Yes, uh, Yes, but, you know, we as humans probably could still recognize it, though. Mm. But AI systems need to have seen something very similar in order to recognize it. That's why they need so much data. They have to be trained, just like our exercise sensors from the last episode. You remember? We had to train them how to do a jumping jack. Learned something. Melina, I love I love how it finally started recognizing it, and then you immediately stopped. <laughs> it goes clink, and then she's done. Nope, that's it. I'm done. How could I forget? Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, anyway, you're likely to have much more training data that shows average traffic lights. And only some or maybe even no training data for really important edge cases. But edge cases are equally important. You still need the system to work, even though something, something looks unusual. Right. So Liu's team, in this example, as a first step, looked at the training data itself. All the traffic light images that the AI has learned from. We can take this data and then we use AI methods called representation learning 
to learn a model from these data sets. And actually this model extracts understandable visual factors from the traffic light images, such as color variations, background variations, or the variations of different symbols and so on. So these visual factors can describe or characterize different traffic lights we see here. So we usually call this disentangled representation in the AI community. Does that mean every image gets tagged with some criteria? Some factors that say what you can see in the image? Yes, exactly. And that way you can group them or categorize them or put them on some sort of scale. Like brighter images to the left and darker images mm -hmm. to the right. And mm, so makes on. sense, yeah. And then the second step is we can generate various kind of edge cases to test a model by combining these factors, you know, in a meaningful way. And the key here is how to efficiently try various kinds of combinations here. So here we use a method called the adversarial learning approach to automate this process to find testing cases that could actually challenge this AI model. That way, they can check how well the model performs. This is similar to how they test AI which plays chess, like our previous example. But let's say with the visual analytics part. And then we can arrange uh, or sort all the traffic light data together with the performance data using these visual factors. And with this visualization, the human or the user can easily understand at the aggregate level which part of this AI model actually doesn't work that well. What do I get to see there? A bunch of statistics? Graphs? Yes, that, and in this case, you also see the actual traffic light images. It's impossible to show you all of the training data, that doesn't make sense. But you can see representative images, which reflect a large number of images, all with similar features. They're mapped, as we discussed before, for example, ordered by brightness or color or other visually based factors. People can quickly see from the visualization supported by this visual factors why this model doesn't work for certain parts. And now comes the cool part of the system. For example, if the user wants more data to address the vagueness that is showcased in a particular part, he can just simply draw a circle for that region and ask the visual analytics system to generate more or augment more data to improve the AI model's robustness or accuracy for these particular parts. Wait, did I get that right? The visual analytics system does a little more than just analytics. It can actually provide a fix for weaknesses that the analysis found? Yes, it, it can directly generate new training data that targets a specific weakness. Okay. New images of traffic lights that look unusual, but in a specific way. Wow, that's pretty cool. Wow. What's great about this is, well, a couple things, actually. One, humans are put right back in the loop here. An actual human brain looks at the AI brain and decides where a fix is needed to improve the reliability or the accuracy of the system. And secondly, in order to do that, you can get a very precise patch. That's a more efficient way than just throwing basically a random and, and sometimes a huge batch of additional training data at the AI. I'm wondering though, is that something that only works in Leo's lab or will it be used in the future? Has visual analytics made it to the real world? Well, both. There are some which are already, quote, out in the wild, and there are others that might be a little farther out before deployment. Let's start with what's already deployed. From the Bosch research perspective, we are mainly using visual analytics to address the challenges for industrial AI applications. And you know one area in industrial AI is modern manufacturing, or we sometimes call it Industry 4.0. There we get all the data from the manufacturing lines. Whereas using our visual analytics system called Lucid Lines, and this system is actually being deployed in a lot of Bosch plants. At those manufacturing lines, they use it for troubleshooting and for process optimization. In general, there are two different categories of use cases for visual analytics what we discussed in the traffic light recognition. This is an example of AI developers wanting to improve their algorithms and getting insights from visual analytics. The other type of use case would be, for example, a doctor using an AI to make a diagnosis. 
In order to understand how the AI came to its conclusion, visual analytics can help and provide some explanations and transparency. So in that sense, with visual analytics, the AI system will not behave like a black box so that we can have more trust here. And when we look a little further, Liu says, visual analytics can also help make AIoT devices better by helping developers decide which data should be kept on an edge device and which data should be sent to the cloud. Jeff, this has been quite a ride through the visual aspects of data. Yeah, but... That was a lot going right? on. Yeah, but I mean, how, <laughs> how exciting is it all? I think we learned that there can be a vast amount of data packed into an image and that our brains are so quick at processing images that we can very efficiently recognize exactly what's going on, yeah. both in real time and at a conceptual level. I think it's good to know that we're still better at certain things than AI systems and that, in fact, human expertise <laughs> is needed to improve the AI and at the same time make it more transparent mm -hmm. by having a look at what's going on inside the black box. Yeah, and that is exactly Bosch's approach to AI. Mm -hmm. Human-friendly, robust, and explainable. Speaking of the black box, again, okay. one last question, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> what's okay. in wait, wait. it? Ask me about the black box <laughs> Oh, God, what's <laughs> in it? What's in the box? I, I still need some visual analytics to look inside. What's in the box? <laughs> That's a great movie reference. I'm sorry. I cannot open it. <laughs> okay. Um, you don't. You don't. You can actually... Oh. I'll tell you what, push, push down on the uh -huh. right side. It's moving. Uh-huh. It's moving. Oh, huh? God. And now, and now push it open from below. Just push the bottom up. Oh, you gave me a tempestry? <laughs> well, a mini tempestry. Well, a climate bracelet. A mini one, yeah. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> Thanks. Well, you can, you can consider this a little parting gift. Because at the end of March, I'm oh. actually moving back to the U.S. But we still do the podcast together, right? We'll keep doing the podcast, I promise. Oh, thank God. <laughs> and I, I, wear, I, I wear my climate <laughs> bracelet from now on, every day. <laughs> I hope so. I hope I can see it in the next Sweet. video call. So before we go, shall we tell listeners what's coming up in the next episode? Absolutely. It's going to be less visual and much more auditory. We're going to discuss why cars need ears and how to build them. Until then, Alfie to Zan. Bye, everyone. Talk to you soon. From know-how to wow. The Bosch Global Podcast. There have been some really cool other uh, knitting data projects. There was one woman who's a councilwoman in, I don't remember the city up in Canada, but she started knitting at the council meetings and she would knit a row for every <laughs> sentence that a man spoke versus a woman speaking in these meetings. Oh, I love that. So it was this gender study of public discourse at a town council, <laughs> which I thought was fascinating. Oh, mercy. And then there was another woman in Germany, I believe, who was knitting her daily commute and the days that the trains were late versus when the trains are on time over the course of a year of commuting to work every day. Oh, God. I'm going to get in trouble for this, but I'm leaving the country anyway. That is that so That sounds German. very German, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> I wanted to hear God. I wanted to say it.